Hello and welcome. We are here today to discuss a very exciting new book on the Mauryan Empire Ashoka. It's a biography that's based mostly on his own writings and words. And I'm here with the author, Professor Patrick Olivelle, who is a professor emeritus at the University of Aust uh, Texas at Austin, and Ramachandra Guha, the eminent historian and writer, who's the series editor of the series in which this is the first book about Indian lives. So thank you both so much for joining me, and I'm really excited to delve into this. Um, just to start, you mention in the book that Ashoka is a really unique figure, both in Indian history and from those times. Uh, one of the reasons you give for this is that he was never particularly keen on talking about his own conquests and achievements. Uh, what are the other things that set him apart? The main thing is that he exposes himself, he opens himself out in his writings uh, to his people in a way that most uh, uh, kings or even politicians rarely do. Uh, he makes himself vulnerable. Uh, he was strong enough to say that he's sorry about various things that he did in his life. Uh, instead of boasting about his conquest, as for example, the parallels you find in Persia, the Persian kings who says how many lands they conquered, he, the only time he talks about his conquest is where he talks about his, uh, his conquest of Kalinga, which is today's Odisha area. And he says that in a sense of regret rather than of boasting about it. And interestingly, I was just thinking the other day that if he had not written about it, we as historians would have no idea that such a battle ever took place because there is no other historical evidence for the Mauryans going and conquering this independent state of uh, Kalinga. So in a sense, it is his own words that come and give us a sense of what he's regretful because 150,000 people were killed, over that many were uh, deported, uh, and others died, the same amount died in, uh, in the aftermath of the, of the war. So, all of that, although we may want to, as historians say, that these numbers may be, may be fudged, may be rounded out and all that, yet a large number died. And if we think of in today's terms, I'm not saying that this is true for the past. If we think of today's term, that would qualify for genocide. And you find the same thing with Alexander uh, when his conquest. Many of his things were genocide. The Carthage uh, during the Roman times, so you have this, uh, genocide was a common, what we call genocide, happened in the past, and it was not a, not, a, a, not a rare occasion, right, yeah. But anyway, in this sense, the Ashoka, I think, is unique in world history, because not just in ancient history, but even in modern history, rarely do we find politicians or people in power saying they're sorry for things they have done in the past. And also their writings are with regard to uh, moral philosophy, how people should behave. There is nothing in Ashoka's uh, writings that deal with governance as such. He doesn't talk about taxation. He doesn't talk about how he gets his money. None of those is there. So that's in that sense, in that sense unique, I think, yeah. Are these some of the reasons for which you chose this to be the first book in this series? No, well, uh, uh, I'll come to that, but just listening to Patrick speak. And on the question of uh, kings uh, being reflective about uh, their style of rule, including the errors and mistakes and deficiencies in their style of rule. Listening to Patrick, I was thinking of, say, Jawaharlal Nehru, who greatly admired Ashoka, but who wrote, med and who was a wonderful stylist like Ashoka, though in the English language. Uh, who wrote meditatively, reflectively, sometimes self-critically about himself, but only before he became Prime Minister. So, you know, his, his uh, autobiography or discovery of India, but then from 47 to 64, even in his personal correspondence, it's hard to find him saying, maybe I should have done this differently in economics. Right. So I think in that sense, you know, uh, uh, that uh, listening to Patrick, that, that strikes me. Or if you look at Churchill. Uh, who was, again, a wonderful stylist. He got the Nobel Prize in Literature, I think not unjustifiably, right? Now, however, uh, when 
as prime minister, when he wrote the history of his prime ministerial term, it was like a self-justificatory. And he, he obviously played an important role as prime minister of Britain in defeating Hitler, but he exaggerated that role and maybe minimized the role of other people, other allies, the Soviets, uh, the Americans, so on. So I think that's still listening to Patrick. That was fascinating to see what made Ashoka special. Now, I'm delighted that this is the first volume because it's so beautifully crafted, it's so sensitive to nuance, uh, but that's partly accident. I mean, the series was conceptualized uh, and the, the idea of the series was that the general reader likes to consume history in the form of biographies. Yeah. Uh, but professional historians have a tendency to disparage biography, that we don't want to spend so much time writing about one person, we'd rather write about politics and kingship in ancient India rather than one ruler. Now, so I was very keen to bridge this. And I was, Patrick and I were in correspondence about some other things. And then I just asked Patrick, asked, have you ever thought of writing on Ashoka? Uh, you've lived with that period, those sources all your life, but you've written about law, you've written about religion, you've written about social structure, you've written textual studies, you've done translations. And the idea struck him and he produced this magnificent book. Now, but and I'm really delighted that this is, I mean, Patrick is Sri Lankan, right? So I told him that this is like a combination of, uh, and we're both cricket fans. So I said, this is kind of Sanat Jaisuriya opening the innings. But there will be Rana Tunga and Arvinda De Silva and others to follow. So there'll be some very good historians writing on uh, maybe modern subjects. So the second book, uh, which will appear in three months, is by Chitraleka Zuchi, who's the leading historian of uh, modern Kashmir, on Sheikh Abdullah. The third book is on Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay by a very fine American historian called Nico Slate. So, you know, I think uh, this is set a very high bar. Yeah. And I'm sure that, I mean, Patrick is, uh, you know, he's sui generis. He's sui generis of, because of the range of his work. But also, uh, uh, you know, he, uh, he has been a scholar for more than 50 years. So the, the second and third volumes are written by people who are, you know, still maturing, but have done a first rate. Uh, so, so I think, uh, I, uh, Patrick's book is it's just riveting and it's so insightful and I think to start this series uh, with this book uh, uh, I will you know encourage the writers to follow uh, to yeah to to fulfill these standards. Um, early on in the book you spend some time establishing that it's likely that Ashoka grew up in a rather multicultural court and household. How rare was that at the time? And what kind of impact do you think that had later when he became the ruler? Yeah. Writing a biography of a person who lived 2,300 years or so ago with so little to go on. Uh, Ram had talked about his friend and mentor, Boyle, the three yeah. laws of Boyle. I'll talk about it tomorrow. And I violate all of them <laughs> because, <laughs> because this you, the, 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 you, I mean, you work with what you have what rather than what laws? you wish you had. Yeah. Uh, and that's all what we have, I think. Will so, you quickly tell us what the three laws so are? Tell you. So yeah. the three laws, this is, I'll, 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 I'll give a brief yeah. background. Yeah. Yeah. My first biography was of a man called Very Relevant. I mean, I came to Gandhi much later. And when I was writing it, I was lucky to be in the same institute in, uh, in Berlin with a, the great biography of Goethe. Nicholas Boyle, Professor okay. of Cambridge, mm -hmm. and he, he was sort of like a mentor to me. And he taught me how, I mean, it, he really made my Elvin biography much better than it was, reading the draft. Yeah. And though he didn't coin it as three laws, but his three you laws were it, one, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, were, uh, uh, you know, uh, always go, uh, well, the, I'll, I'll tell you, the, the three orders with the important. First, look for sources other than those emanating from your principal character. So okay. Elvin wrote, 40 books, 400 mm. newspaper articles, 4,000 letters, and like quite with Nehru and Gandhi, yeah. so, or Ambedkar. So you can write the whole book based on what they have said. Right. So look for sources well, that come from a second party, a third party, a tenth party, mm -hmm. maybe a friend, an admirer. That's the first law. Yeah. The second law is the relationship to secondary characters, yeah. characters illuminate the principal character. Mm. So if you write about Ambedkar, there'll yeah. be a light on Gandhi. Right. Uh, if you look at their interaction, yeah. or, or or you know, uh, or with Nehru and sure. shall we say the Hindu right, yeah. so that is the second law. Mm -hmm. That the secondary that pay adequate attention to the secondary characters. Yeah. Don't just focus on the principal hmm. character. And the third law is always go chronologically. Yeah. So okay. a, a life is yeah. lived 
forward but understood backwards. But it's lived right. from day to day. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, in the case of Elwin, uh, he was a celibate mm -hmm. because of Gandhi. But then he became fragrantly exalting sex. Okay. But let that slowly develop. Right. Don't say, you know, because the reader is saying, what an idiot to follow Gandhi in Brahmacharya. <laughs> And you, as an admirer, you want to say, actually, he later changed his mind. <laughs> yeah. But don't, don't keep the reader in suspense. Yeah. You know, if you're a sociologist or an economist, hmm. you tend to state your thesis quite early. Yeah. This is a book about inequality. And you know, so the reader already knows the inequality is growing or something. Right? Hear the suspense, because that's how mm. the life, life is totally right. unpredictable right. and unexpected. Yeah. So these are the three laws, which in retrospect, I realize, only apply to the biographer of a modern person yeah. where the sources are rich enough. Right. So that's what uh, sure. Patrick right. means when he says he violates that. Anyway, yeah. talking, getting back to your yeah. original question about multiculturalism, this is where a biography like what I did has to have a certain amount of imagination mm. and, and, uh, and maybe even, uh, even uh, trying to imagine what would have been there uh, to draw out perhaps sometimes more than is permitted yeah. from the few sources we have. So basically, Alexander's conquest mm -hmm. of the Middle East, West Asia, all the way into what is today Pakistan, uh, was a major, major event. Right. Not just that he came and conquered, but he left behind Greek culture and Greek kingdoms from Egypt to mm -hmm. what is today Afghanistan, mm -hmm. right? And uh, the the Seleucid Empire was the one with which Chandragupta Maurya dealt with. Yeah. And uh, there's a wonderful books written about the Seleucid Empire recently. And what this person talks about is the so-called Indus Treaties, the Treaty of the Indus between Chandragupta and the Seleucus I, uh, which established boundaries mm. of autonomous kingdoms, which had never existed. Yeah. Uh, if you look at our uh, old great friend Kautilya in his Arthashastra, he, he talks about the king as forever wishing to conquer. In Sanskrit, he calls it Vijigishu, one who wishes to conquer. That is the defining element of a king. Mm. Uh, this was contravened in this uh, emergent uh, yeah. concept of bounded kingdoms. And, uh, and this became part of the Mauryan Empire. And after this, this treaty, in all likelihood, there was the exchange of women, which was normally done. Mm. So Seleucid's a prince from the family, may not be his own daughter, but somebody, came to Chandragupta's. Mm. Clearly, there's a Greek influence then. Right. Uh, and uh, Ashoka may have been a young boy then, maybe three, four, five, when Chandragupta died uh, and during that period. Uh, so there was a Greek presence mm. in the Chandragupta. Uh, then his own father uh, may have had a Greek well, Wives, if you want to call it that, uh, they are there too. Uh, so he, he, so in my imagination, at least, yeah. I think there is a there is a multicultural, and his own thinking mm. when he when he got his uh, inscriptions translated and inscribed in Greek and in <coughs> Aramaic. Strangely enough, Aramaic was not really spoken by anybody. Mm. It was the uh, it was the Persian uh, language of the, uh, of the chancery. So only some people knew that, but it became iconic. Yeah. You know? So two iconic uh, languages, Greek, the great Alexanders, and then, and, uh, and I think that could have been done only by a person who had that, that larger vision mm. that comes from being brought up in a multicultural, what we would call today, yeah. uh, environment here. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned earlier about um, Kalinga and his expression of remorse because of the destruction that that caused. But then you also say that that shouldn't mean that we call him a pacifist. Right. So 
first how would you explain that and also how much evidence is there for this common conception that it was that battle that then led him to embrace buddhism yes i i talk about that a little bit yeah. in trying to draw up a chronology mm -hmm. here again very speculative yeah. you know i grant it mm -hmm. uh, it's not uh but uh, but all this happened i think within the period of about 2 years mm -hmm. even less uh so there was a moment when he turned he was he himself says in his first minor rock inscription that he was a buddhist you know yeah. uh and uh that that he followed that but he was a so so buddhist right mm. he really dabbled in it yeah. but he was from magadha after all you know that was the place where jainism and buddhism mm. was thriving uh so that's good. but then he says that then he went to see the monks there's no one monk or many it says a sangha yeah. right so that's monastic mm. order after which he became uh, he became he says zealous uh, uh in this and that was the time when he says he became a upasaka mm. which is a technical buddhist term for a committed buddhist uh but at the same time if you go with the chronology you find that the uh that the battle of uh, kalinga was probably done a uh, year and a half or so or less uh before this time right so putting two and two together and yeah. arriving at five <laughs> uh, one can maybe come up with a with a yeah. with a chronology that links at least chronologically mm -hmm. the two events mm -hmm. you know uh whether they are connected in his own mind in his own life yeah. uh that is of course he doesn't say right. anywhere right yeah. Yeah. yeah you say also that it's more appropriate to refer to him as a king who was a buddhist right. rather than a buddhist king yeah um so i'm asking where would you draw that balance especially given the centrality of moral philosophy which was first based more on buddhism and then later on more on a sort of um not referring to a particular religion but right. just dharma as a more inclusive right. idea so given the centrality of that in his messaging where do you draw that line right so um again uh, taking the few clues that we have i try to say that if the king who wrote the first minor rock inscription which is the most widespread especially in karnataka you know go in the south if that person was ashoka throughout his life he would have been a buddhist king but that didn't happen i try to imagine what may have happened after writing this sometime in june of a year i can't tell you exactly what it was um and uh, and then within a year or two he starts writing about dharma so i sort of imagine that some intervention took place he went home he had been traveling for 8 months uh, during which time he was imitating the lifestyle of a monk on his travels he came home maybe somebody got to him saying that hey guy you can't do this <laughs> right you can't be a buddhist and and rule over this immense kingdom there's something wrong here or he had second thoughts maybe he thought i want to do something larger than buddhism better than buddhism more important than buddhism there could have been many ways in which we can you know slice this but ultimately he changed he changed over a period short again two years maybe at the most when he then started writing about dharma and in all his major rock inscriptions 14 of them he never one months mentioned buddhism except in passing to refer to among others among other jains and ajivakas and brahmins so he never once brings buddhism as the focus of his message uh, which tells me that he has from here to here was different and this is what defined his much of his kingdom uh, much of his uh, rule so in that sense i think he was a buddhist he remained a buddhist because during this time he wrote two inscriptions that are specifically buddhist the bairat inscription that was written uh, trying he he this guy who is a king but he was a layman 
trying to tell Buddhist monks what to read. He was sending him a, him a reading list saying that, hey, you want you read these. These are the important Buddhist things. And then he intervenes in the, in the schism edict uh, about, uh, about uh, monks who are troublemakers, uh, who cause dissension in the, in the thing, and how they should be expelled. So yeah, he, he, he remained a Buddhist. And he was very, uh, he, he tried to intervene in ways almost sort of high-handed uh, for a king. Uh, with regard to monks, um, but in his real inscriptions, that is, his message to the people, Buddhism is in the background, not in the foreground. Uh, you use this categorization of civil religion to talk about how he sort of tried to bring this very large and very diverse population he was ruling over together. Um, so, and through his models, philosophy as well, could you talk a little bit about how he did that? Yes, uh, I don't know whether he did that. <laughs> I'm sorry, whether, how he attempted this to do that. Me yeah. trying to figure out, theorize yeah. how he may have done it, right? Yeah. Uh, and this is, of course, modern categories, right? Mm -hmm. From Rousseau to Bella uh, that we are dealing with, uh, yeah. with, uh, with this. Uh, but uh, trying to find out what was he trying to do mm. by presenting this moral philosophy, this Dharma philosophy, right? Uh, and... Uh, and I was trying to see how he may have been trying to forge a certain identity for a people who had no identity. But remember that this is a large country which had never been brought into a single unity. Uh, even under Ashoka, there may have been large areas of India that were sort of left out on its own. Uh, and uh, so how did he do that? And why did he do that? And uh, two or three things happened. He tried to bring, uh, Ashoka was the first to write, as far as you know, right? So he, he brings the first public documents written. You can actually go and see it. There are talking stones, which had never existed before. And what would, what would that have done to, to people who you know, encountered this? He wrote in a single language. Uh, he wrote in different scripts. Script is not the same as language, and often people confuse this because today in India, scripts are often connected to specific languages. But if you're in Sanskrit like me, Sanskrit is written when I was, did my edition of Manu, I was dealing with nine scripts. It's the same text, same language, but in nine scripts. Right? So he used a language which we call Magadhi, for want of a better thing, which is the Prakrit that was probably the native tongue of people who lived in the Magadha region. Uh, and he writes that everywhere, in, including Karnataka, Gujarat, Bengal, Nepal. Yeah. So he's bringing a certain uniformity, of what we call in the, in, the, in the Western world, a koine, you know, a, a, a language that is not commonly used, uh, often a businessman will use it. Uh, into that. So you have a script, a language, uh, and I think third ingredient of this was a certain uh, common identity of, of um, aspiration, uh, life, what life means, how should we live our lives, uh, what, what are our final goals of, as a human being. Uh, Sanskrit, we call it the artha. The, the goals we go on. And, and I think we can think of that, uh, at least theorize it, using Rousseau's word uh, as, a, as, a, as a modern kind of a civil religion. In other words, you can be a Buddhist, you can be a Jain, you can be a Ajivika, you can be a Brahmin, but still connect at this upper level, almost the umbrella level of ideology, which is Dharma for him, right? And people don't realize that, that the, Today, we think dharma is so important, so central for all of India, that it was there from the very beginning. It was not. All these, language, all these words have histories, and it's important to understand the history of it. If you look at the early Vedic period, uh, dharma starts with the Rig Veda 68 times there, but later on it became a marginal, I think. And then this marginality uh, is ruptured with Buddhism, and especially with Ashoka, in this small number of, uh, of uh, 3,000 odd words, 
He uses dharma over a hundred times. Right? So it's, it's, a, it's a frequently, of, it's, it's a centerpiece of his thought. Right? And, uh, and that is, uh, that is he's, not, he's not just repeating what everybody was saying. He was doing something new. And that I think at least we can think of as he's trying to forge a common spiritual life of the country. Uh, the first time in world history, I think, that the political authority in the name of the king here was trying to have a mass education campaign, educating the people. Uh, in here, of course, in, in moral philosophy, but that's the whole point of these letters that he wrote. They're not edicts, really. Everybody calls it an edict, yeah. but these are letters, you know, they are letters. So I, I often call Ashoka's writings rather than edicts to, to make yeah. it a, a broader thing. Yeah. yeah. You've said in your book that the corpus of his writings available to us today are about 4,614 yes. words. Thank you. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> and like you said, these are words in which he's, you know, asking the people to live in a certain way and also telling them about his philosophy. And of course, some are a little more administrative. Um, you also said that some of these writings have literary merit. And yes. so we can call him a writer. Today, when we think of political leaders making speeches or writing in various forms, the assumption is that the ideology is there, but theirs, but the words are not theirs. Uh, there's a speech writer or a publicist right. uh, who is behind the precise right. words. Uh, what are the chances that these are in fact Ashoka's words and should that impact how we're reading them? Yes, um, I mean, there is no way to tell, yeah. of course. The, 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 you can argue both ways, but the, mm. the argument for one or the other are equally weak. Right? Mm. Uh, and we can, uh, there, if you go to the parallels in the, in the Roman Empire at the time, uh, there was a uh, epistolographer, I think it's called, the writer of epistles. Yes. Epistles are you know, official writings. So there were clear, were, clearly may have been uh, writers in the chancery of Ashoka who were responsible for diplomatic communications, etc. that had to be done. Um, were they the people who actually wrote these Personally, I think not, but I can't defend it. I, I don't have real proof to defend it. But when you read this as I have done, uh, like every word, and, and you get a certain feel for, for the writer, right? you get as you read it. And you, I, don't, I assume you could do today a computer, mm -hmm. uh, you know, AI could be able to see, did this, it was it written person? by this same person, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I, I, I don't have the knowledge to do that. Yeah. Um, but but the, you get a certain feel for it. And I think there is uh, Ashoka uh, behind those words. Mm. Even if not every word of that may have been written by him. Yeah. They were certainly not written because once in Gujarat, for example, uh, there were, they were semi-translations. Mm. So what... Uh, the word, for example, for, uh, for a daughter uh, uh, in, in Magadhi is one thing. And these people translate into a much more Sanskritic thing over here. Yeah. There are many, many. I give some examples of right. that. So, so clearly, they were not his words. Yeah. Somebody is translating now. Then it was translated into Aramaic and Greek. Clearly, they were the work of translators, okay. right? Uh, but but there is a... There is a personality behind. Mm. That's all we can say. And that, yeah. that personality, in that sense, these are the words of, uh, of uh, even today's politicians, if they are good politicians, I mm. think, would, would give, would not parrot what somebody else has written, right. but want that person to say what he wants to say, perhaps in a better way, yeah. more eloquent way, you know, but yeah. still they are his words, I think. Yeah, so, so yeah, I think, I think these, we can say, are uh, Ashoka's uh, yeah. writings in that broad sense. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, going back to his sort of attempt to build this unifying moral philosophy, uh, you refer to his usage of the term pasanda and then how that changed mm -hmm. 
going and later became more der uh, right. derogat derogatory. Yeah. Um, so what was his meaning of it and what did it mean for him to call himself a patron of all Pasandas and what was the impact of that? Right, right. Yes, so this is, uh, the, the, uh, there are four parts of my book yeah. and I try to think that each of parts as uh, two, uh, as four aspects of mm. what Ashoka was, his mm. defining characteristics. Yeah. And the last one is that he's an ecumenist. Right. I use the word, of course, the word didn't exist at the time. Yeah. We are again imposing something category from here. Yeah. It means that he wanted people uh, following different ideologies and religions, etc., uh, to connect with each mm -hmm. other, uh, to be at a minimum, be civil to yeah. each other, uh, and at the best, as the, as the ultimate, to learn from each other. Mm. Uh, the word he uses some avaya, which comes from uh, some other e, to come together in so gathering, meeting, uh, so that they can talk to each other yeah. and learn from each other. And he says you cannot be the word he uses in in the same in Sanskrit and in Prakrit, shruta, sutta, shru, hearing, right? Uh, and it finds in in Hindi and every every modern Indian language. And Bahu Shruta in Sanskrit, Bahu Shruta in Pali, means much heard, because mm. it means nothing, uh, yeah. much heard, which means one who has heard a lot. Right. Uh, uh, in English, we would have the word read, uh, a well-read man, right? Uh, yeah. A well-read man cannot be well-read unless he reads a lot of people, right? Mm. A much heard man cannot be much heard unless he listens to other people. Mm. That's what he's, he's getting at, I yeah. think. And, and this is where... Uh, he's much ahead of his time, I think, yeah. um, because if you read around the writings of various religions, both Brahminical and Buddhist, uh, and I give a couple of examples there, they're calling each other names, right? Uh, Buddhists are comparing Brahmins favorably, I mean, mm. dogs favorably to Brahmins, yeah. right? <laughs> Dogs are better than Brahmin. Uh, and, and the Brahmins likewise give back the same way. So yeah, I, th I think he was trying to do something at which he probably failed. Mm. The failures we don't yeah. understand because... Right. Uh, but clearly, if, if there was religious harmony during his time, if he was able to bring them together, it did not last too long. Yeah. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, but there's a last question I'd like to pose to both of you. Um, you say at some point in your book that the reimagination of the past to fit the needs of the present is inherently human. So what does that mean for how Ashoka is remembered and spoken of today? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, this is rather difficult for me to hmm. do that uh, because unlike Ram, uh, I... I'm so much in the past <laughs> that I don't do that much in the present. Yeah. Uh, but I will give a talk at Ashoka University. Uh, their patron saint is Ashoka, after mm. all, uh, to bring uh, bring liberal arts education and Ashoka's work with Pashandas into dialogue mm -hmm. to say that liberal arts education uh, ultimately is where you listen to others, you listen to a wide spectrum of intellectual pursuits, a wide spectrum of ideas, uh, respecting everything, not accepting everything, right? right? But able, therefore, to interrogate this, mm. uh, but become better persons, uh, better scholars, uh, better citizens, uh, who, who are able to, to go beyond themselves and their own little world. This a little world is the Pasanda, yeah. right? The, the larger world is the inter Pasanda dialogue. Right. And the little worlds we can think about, uh, about little worlds we come from, mm. our family, our group, our socioeconomic group. In India, it could be a caste. Mm. It could be many other small groups. Uh, but the ability to then transcend that, to penetrate those walls and to see the others, I think that is a, it's a, it's a lasting legacy yeah. of Ashoka as we read his own writings. Yeah. 
So uh, I'd say that uh, I, mean, I always hes hesitate even, uh, about what lessons one can draw from the past. Hmm. Even though in my own work, I mean, the two sides, I write scholarly books about the past and I write polemical independence of the present. And I like to keep them separate. Mm. Uh, so, but I think the great value of uh, Patrick's book is that it shows you another world. Uh, and it, it brings you into the world of, uh, you know, ancient India. Their debates, their arguments, their lifestyles, uh, their anxieties, mm. uh, through this very special figure. Yeah. And uh, in, in that sense, uh, you know, history is a broader form of education without any immediate lessons on to how to conduct sure. Your life today. Uh, uh, now, just listen to Patrick. If I may deviate very little, yeah, because please. it's so fascinating listening to him. Yeah. One thing that struck me while reading Patrick's book mm. uh, is that uh, Nehru actually references Ashoka right. and admired Ashoka, and yeah. including in, in the, the symbol, the symbol and, yeah. and all, all of that. But there's virtually no reference in Gandhi's writings. But when I read Patrick's book and his analysis of uh, you know, when he says, uh, when he says that Ashoka is the only king who said sorry, yeah. Gandhi may be the only politician who said, I have made a Himalayan blunder. Or if you look at ecumenism mm. and relations between your faith and another faith, yeah. or if you look at Gandhi's much more expansive view of Dharma than is right. there in the narrow Brahminical tradition, it's intriguing. I wonder, uh, I just wonder, uh, you know, that maybe Gandhi takes something from Ashoka without acknowledging it. Yeah, uh, did he read Ashoka during mm. that time? Nehru did. I mean, Nehru did, of course. Yeah, yeah, quite a lot. Gandhi but not, Gandhi not, didn't, not, uh, didn't uh, tap on to that. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Thank you both so Thank much you. for, for joining us, us today. Yeah, 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 this is great. Thank you.